Is it a struggle? Yes, we have to realize our strengths and our weaknesses. Hi, and welcome to Why Why Not, and I'm your host, Janice. We're the show that's providing interesting topics with interesting guests to help people to reach their goals. Now, today's topic has been in the news, actually, lately, talking about home appraisals, um, different issues with diversity issues. But we're going to talk today about what's actually involved in a home appraisal. So we think I need people to understand what is the actual process that appraiser has to go through from either getting the order all the way to delivering the report. And today I have a wonderful special guest here. Um, his name is John Brennan. He is a chief appraiser at Clear Capital, which is an appraisal management company. And he's gonna to talk to us today about the process of actual having a home appraisal done. Welcome, John. Thank you, Janice. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I'm so happy about having this show just to give people um, some information about what's actually involved because most people don't understand. And I'm, well, at least disclose, I'm also appraiser of like 23 years. And for old days, we used to do what's called the drive-by appraisals, if you remember those. Sure do. Um, a lot of people remember the drive-by appraisal. The appraiser didn't come into the house or anything like that. We drove by and maybe we might have stopped the car to take the photo. <laughs> but normally it was like 20 miles an hour snap and kept going. But things have changed that people are actually going into homes and they're meeting the appraiser and it's a big process. Okay. Can you first tell us a little bit about your background as an appraiser? Sure. Thanks, Janice. Um, yeah, I have actually, appraisal is the only career I've ever known. Uh, I was in uh, college and working for a savings and loan, which tells you how far back that is. There's probably some viewers that don't even know what a savings and loan is because there's not many of them around anymore. Right. <laughs> They uh, they said, you know, um, I was I was going to go into the branch manager training program. I was going to become a manager at the branch where I was working as a teller part time while I was in college. And uh, before I, I went down to sign up for the branch manager training program and a friend of mine who worked in the appraisal department said, hey, while you're down here, you know, we're right across the street. Why don't you come over and talk to my boss? And I said, okay, what about? And he said, well, just about appraising. And, and I said, I know you're an appraisal, an appraiser, but I don't know what you do. I don't even know what an appraisal is. So, you know, being able to talk about this is really great. So I started with them. They trained me, you know, they, I talked to the, I talked to the boss. He said, why not try it? You know, six months later, you don't like it. You can go back. The branch manager training program will always be there, but give it a shot because there's some really good things about being an appraiser that you might enjoy. So they started training me from the ground up. They had, you know, they had a staff of established appraisers there who would mentor me, who, who would, you know, encourage you to get appraiser education, who would really walk you through and kind of hold your hand through the whole process, starting with, you know, the very basics all the way to, to completing uh, appraisal reports. And so I started there. I did um, I did a residential appraisal work there for several years. I eventually started doing commercial appraisal work there on things like shopping centers and subdivisions and hotels, things like that. Um, I then moved on, uh, spent several more years doing commercial appraisals, and then I went and uh, took a job working for a large financial institution, one that still exists today, uh, as the manager of a residential appraisal. Um, office in a district and did that for several years and then ultimately um, found uh, an opportunity to go to work for the state of California mm -hmm. and I did that and I was the chief of the licensing and enforcement uh, for the California Bureau of Real Estate Appraisers. I worked for the state as a salaried employee and I did that for almost nine years um, and then got an opportunity to work at the Appraisal Foundation, which is an organization that sets the standards and qualifications for appraisers. And I spent about 16 and a half years there before coming to Clear Capital about two years ago uh, as the chief appraiser. So I, I have all my experience has been related to appraising and appraisals. I know it very well and I'm very passionate about the profession. No, oh, great. I mean, like I said, I've been doing it for 23 years and I, I love it. That's part of my life. Now, yeah, absolutely. Now, for most people don't understand when they say someone has to come in your house. First, someone gets an order, appraiser gets an order. Now, 
those aren't selective, is it? I mean, it could be random or how do even people get orders typically from like a regular appraisal management company or lender? Yeah, so, you know, uh, first of all, I, I want to clear, you know, appraisals are done for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. The majority, the vast majority are for lending purposes, as we're talking about here. Uh, right. But appraisals could be done for divorce cases, right. probates, partnerships, things like that. Um, so just to help, you know, understand a little bit about the appraisal, about appraisal being bigger than just for lending, but clearly the vast majority of appraisals done in this country are for lending purposes. The, um, and to your question, the, an appraisal management company works with, with lenders, you know, your, your very, very well-known lenders around the country could be with mortgage brokers, could be with smaller loan companies. They have an appraisal management company act as the entity to find the appraiser to do the to do the assignment and then to check the appraisal and make sure it's done according to all of the requirements and then forward it back to them to be able to use that appraisal to determine whether or not they want to make a loan. So one of the reasons appraisal management companies exist is to make sure that that there's independence between what the um, loan company or the or the the, the bank wants mm -hmm. and what is reality in terms of the value, so that it avoids things like pressuring appraisers and right. trying to get them uh, to do the assignment at a certain level or whatever. So when the when the appraisal management company gets an order from the lender, as, as you've asked. They have, we have a panel of appraisers across the country that we have worked with. And when they, for a particular market, we will be able to identify those who have done a, who work with us very well and have a very good reputation. And we solicit them and say, you know, do you have the ability to perform this assignment within this time frame? And if so, here's the fee, you know, please go forward and, and perform the assignment. If they don't, then we go to the next person or the next next several people, depending on on the numbers. But it's that it's that panel of appraisers that really is what makes the strength of an appraisal management company. For example, we have we have over sixty five hundred appraisers nationwide mm -hmm. that we can go to and say we really need these appraisals done. Can you do them for us in the time and and mm -hmm. uh, under the conditions that are being asked for? And that eliminates also a loan officer picking certain people. So there's no pressure on them. There's no undue influence. You know, hey, buddy, I really need this value. It eliminates all that. It eliminates that bias and pressure. That's absolutely correct. And that, that actually was, that actually did happen historically. There were, mm -hmm. um, you know, most of your viewers probably aren't familiar with the savings and loan crisis from the 1980s, but many probably remember the 2007, 2008 housing bubble. Yeah. And some of the problems that came out of that were there wasn't enough, you know, independence between the appraiser and the loan officer exactly to your point. So appraisal management companies have, just as you said, acted as a buffer, an independent neutral buffer to yeah. try to avoid any of that type of undue influence. Right. So most appraisers don't know the loan officers or anything like that at all. So That's there's right. no influence. That's a That's good start. Right. So they get an order from the appraisal management company. You go through your criteria, make sure that they're well qualified. They know the area geographically. Now they have the order. Now the appraiser, do they make contact with the owner or does like someone else typically? Yeah. Under most circumstances, the appraiser will make the contact with the uh, the point of contact, it could be the homeowner. If it's a purchase, it could be a broker that's involved. Um, and the reason for that is obviously if they are going to come inside the home, you know, you want to make sure that the, the homeowners are ready, that they're comfortable, that, you know, that everything, right. you know, some people don't like to go have people go in their house if it's not really neat and tidy and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the appraiser makes that contact and says, what would be a good time for you? I'm looking at these dates and times. Would any of these work? And uh, try to schedule that, that, uh, that inspection time at the property. Okay, so first step, you make contact with the homeowner, typically by phone or email, set up appointment that's good for them and you that works to please both people. 
Next step is now they're knocking on the door, meeting either the homeowner, the future buyer, or they could be meeting an agent possibly. Now, what's the first step appraiser look at when they get to the house? Now, we're just going to go over the inspection part. Then we'll go over the other aspect of appraisals. What do you sure. look at when you first get to the house? Sure. And, and that's a great point. You mentioned, you know, we'll go over the other part because a lot of times people will see an appraiser out of the property and, and they may only be there for 20, 30, 40 minutes and they think that's the end of it. Right. But for, for an appraiser, that's just the beginning. That's the very beginning of the assignment. So we'll talk more about that. But appraisers have different um, preferences. Some appraisers will say, I want to start on the outside of the house. I want to go take some pictures on the outside. I want to do some measurements. Other appraisers may say, you know, I want to walk through the inside of the house first, take some pictures, and then I'll go outside and do this. So it's, there's no set, you know, order in which this is done. But what is done is the appraiser goes uh, through the house. So we'll say they start with the interior first. They go through the house and they walk through all the rooms and they're noting the various features of the home, you know, how many bedrooms there are, how many bathrooms there are. They're looking at the condition of the home. Um, you know, is the home in, in, been maintained well? Is there some deferred maintenance, some items that need, you know, fixing up? Um, right. They're looking at the quality of the home, not only the actual, you know, construction, the frame. So like the materials, the, correct? The, like That's right. That's okay. right. You know, so, you know, you have, and, and a lot of people see now with, with online services like, you know, MLS and Realtor.com and things like mm -hmm. that, where they can see, you know, the varying levels of materials throughout a home. You can see, you know, one home may have a Formica countertop and the next one might have a granite countertop. And, right. and you can see how those are different. And so an appraiser is, is looking at all the different finishes, the quality of the features, um, noting things like the types of appliances that the home has, noting things like um, whether or not um, there, are, there are any special features, for example, a fireplace. Um, you know, there are, there are some areas where it's very rare to have a fireplace. Right. You know, yeah. so that so the appraiser is going to walk through and note everything, everything about the house, everything about the features. If it's a two story house, they'll go upstairs and they'll do the same upstairs. Uh, if the home has a basement, they will go down and look at the basement. Mm -hmm. And then part of what they what they then do as they kind of transition to the to the outside portion is they will start measuring the house. And the reason I say that, that it's a transition is because some houses you know, the second story doesn't match the first story exactly. You might have a house that has a second story that's open, part of it's open to below. And so the appraiser has to kind of work with between, you know, what, what the second story is versus what the first story is and be able to measure that kind out. Kind of like Same a room that has a, kind of like a room with like a two-story foyer or something, or like the family room's two stories, you know, you have the up higher ceilings like that. Exactly right. Exactly right. Because, you know, what, what the appraiser is doing these measurements for is to come up with what's called the gross living area or the GLA. Okay. And so if you've got a home that has that two-story foyer or that two-story mm -hmm. living room, it's beautiful. And I mean, it's a, it's a great feature, but that second, that second floor isn't actually a livable area because it's just space. So the appraiser can't measure that second floor the same as the first floor because the first floor you can actually put furniture on and live in, whereas that second floor would be somewhat different. Now, gross living area you're referring to in layman's term, basically how big your house is, typically not counting the basements, although I know some markets may count that depending if they're partially up upgrade or not. But it's predominantly the gross living area is how large is your house above grade that you can live in? So like an you have, may have a sunroom, but if you don't have heat in this sunroom, it's technically not gross living area or livable space, correct? Yes, that's exactly right. You know, mm -hmm. and, and the thing that, that, you know, some homeowners, you know, get a little confused about is, you know, even if, even if there's like a sunroom, for example, that's mm -hmm. not included in the gross living area, that doesn't mean that it's not worth something. You know, right. an appraiser will still consider that as part of the appraisal, but for it to be considered gross living area, to exactly to your point, it needs to have heating or air conditioning. If that's if the house has air conditioning, it needs to you know have certain features that you know a closet for a bedroom, and there needs to be windows and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that is what the appraiser is looking for as they go through all of those things. And so it's important, like you say, you know, the basement certainly you know 
it, it varies, right? You can have a completely right. finished large basement, or you can have just a small, a small basement with a sump pump and a you know, little area for the utility uh, equipment like the furnace and such. Right, which that part would not be considered living area or counting your square footage. Correct. Now, question though, is it sometime the tax assessors, which is technically different from appraiser, they may include or make their gross living areas different? Yeah, How do you we know, deal with that when talking to a homeowner like, well, the tax assessor says my property is 3,000 square feet and you say it's only 2,000? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question because it is something that is front and center in our industry right now. And that is that there's really been a lack of standards implemented mm -hmm. for what's living area, what isn't, how you measure it. For example, if a wall is, is 35 feet and five inches long, is that 35 and a half feet? Is it 35 and a quarter feet? Where do you round off? Same oh. thing goes for um, right. exactly what you're talking about in terms of an assessor. They may include, uh, for example, uh, a, a, a home has an area that's just devoted to Partial base, like a, tri a split level. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. There, there are a lot of different nuances of just about everything you can imagine. And the way that an assessor may measure it may be based off certain plans. Uh, you know, depending on if it's a custom or semi-custom home, sometimes plans get changed in midstream right. and, you know, they get approved and they're permitted, but the assessor may not get that updated information. So it's a very, very um, tricky thing to try to reconcile what those different square footages might come out at. You know, the appraiser is required to use, you know, the information they have that's most reliable to them to try to determine what the actual gross living area is. Right, and most reliable if he's actually at the property, that's measurement, because he physically measured it, you know, that's the most proper one. And then also you gotta think about people, uh, tax assessors have a different role even in why they're doing it. They're doing it to assess your property for money <laughs> for taxes. So it would behoove them to make your home bigger and like, oh, let's count that basement. Let's count that bathroom in the basement versus appraisers who are doing what we are taught from our standards. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great point. You know, I, um, you know, I think assessors are are generally um, are generally obligated to try to come up with a fair market value. Um, you know, how that actually plays out in you know small town America and things like that might be very different from place to place. Um, but the appraisers we have the uniform standards of professional appraisal practice that go throughout the country and we are required to use the recognized methods and techniques. And again, probably one of the most important things is the obligation within those standards to always be independent, impartial, and objective. So we're not measuring a house for a purpose. We're measuring, you know, like, should, should it be worth more? Should it be worth less? We're measuring it to find out what the actual size of the property is. Right, okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. Well, let's get back to the exterior now. So the so the appraiser is going to you know walk around the exterior of the home. Um, you know that again they might be they might be measuring it at the same time either with a tape measure, or a laser tool, or different different tools that are available, and they're going to uh, try to uh, look at the same time for anything that might appear problematic. Uh, such as cracks in the foundation and things like that. Now, it's really important to understand that an appraiser is not a home inspector. You know, an appraiser is not expected to know what's going on, you know, on the found, in the foundation, what's going on inside the walls. Mm -hmm. An appraiser is just looking at readily observable characteristics. Mm -hmm. So if an appraiser sees a hairline crack uh, along a stucco wall, you know, that's probably not an issue at all. If they see a large crack and a gap on the on a on a concrete block of the foundation, that may be more significant. So they're going to be noting things like this that, that they see. They're also going to be noting the characteristics in the backyard. Does it have a patio, a pool? What are the features that it has? Um, you know, because that's all part of, of what an appraiser is doing, is supposed to be doing, and that is mirroring the marketplace. So when I say, what I mean by that is 
a lot of people misunderstand that they think an appraiser determines their value. And while that may be true with an assessor, as you pointed out, for right. tax purposes, an appraiser is not determining value. They're simply providing their opinion of value. And they use, we use the same tools, the same methods that buyers and sellers would use to be able to try to figure out the value, looking at other sales and things like that, that we can talk more about briefly. But that's what the appraiser is trying to do, is trying to say, okay, I'm noting all these features, I'm noting the condition, I'm noting what's going on with this property. Now, let me see how the marketplace looks at these things. And they will do research on sales and listings to try to see what those, what those features might be worth. All right. Now, since the economy is changing so rapidly because of this pandemic and what happened prior to the pandemic with, you know, the issues with the housing industry in 2008 and 2007, it's like maybe 90 days later, prices may either increase in some markets. I think they're actually starting to maybe start, you know, evening out. So if we choose a comp from which is a closed sale from like a year ago, yes, that may not be the same as today. So what is preferable, I mean, just generic guidelines that people should use as appraiser, like how far should they go and things like that typically? Well, the, you know, the, the classroom situation, the ideal situation mm -hmm. is, is the most recent similar properties that have sold are your best indicators. So something that right. sold to your point a week ago, and it's the same house, say in a subdivision, uh, that's a great indicator of what this house might be worth. Again, you're gonna adjust for some differences, but that's a really strong indicator. A house that's considerably smaller or larger that sold six months or a year ago, now you're starting to, you know, to, to, to have to do a little more digging on not only what the marketplace has done, to your point, has it gone up, has it gone down, if so, how much. You, the appraiser makes adjustments for these factors, but it's, you know, there's a little art and a little science, and the appraiser really has to understand what those factors are to do a credible uh, analysis. And so, you know, the, the more dissimilar the home, mm -hmm. the, longer, um, the longer it's been since it's sold, the more complicated the, the appraisal process is. So if a homeowner is trying to get an idea of what their home is worth, the most recent, most similar homes to theirs are really the strongest indicators. Because appraisers are trying to compare or make or get a estimate of market value, it's an estimate opinion of market value based on what people typically would pay for in your market and has paid for in your market. It's basically it's the has paid, it's past, net present is what they pass have paid. You know, if these people have been in the market and they've paid $100,000 per se for, you know, every house in this little subdivision sold for 100,000 over the last six months, then most likely your home is closer to that versus, oh no, everything's going up in the future, it should be 200,000. So we're going by what buyers are willing to pay and have paid, not future pay, future pens, but they have paid mm -hmm. up until that date. Correct. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And 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 you know, to your point, that you know, they're active listings, properties that are actively listed mm -hmm. for sale. Um, they might be a real good indicator of where, where value trends are going. Are they going up? Are they going? But you know, for because somebody can technically list the house for sale for whatever price they want. One million dollars. <laughs> One million dollars. <laughs> that that does not mean the home is really worth a million dollars. So the appraiser has to look at that and take it with a grain of salt because really, you know, a, 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 an appraiser, one, one comp, and a comp is a, sale, a home that is sold or even a listing in some cases, doesn't make the market. You know, the appraiser has to look at, at the greater market, the number, a number of sales that have sold and how, they, how they've transacted and, and what the value trend is based on those. And for a typical home, and I'm not saying anything that's unique or special, but a typical home, do you have to stay nearby? You can't just say, you know, I live in this neighborhood, but I'm going to go two towns over just for a regular split level house, can you? It, you know, you again, you want the homes to be as similar as possible so that, you know, being in the same neighborhood, you know, that's where you want, that's what you want to do. You want the home to be that similar. Um, the problem is sometimes homes don't sell in that neighborhood. 
Yeah. So an appraiser may have to go to a competing neighborhood, what we call mm -hmm. competing neighborhoods. And if they do, that's fine. But the homeowner or the, excuse me, the appraiser has to identify, you know, is there a market preference for that neighborhood? Is there a market preference for the neighborhood I'm appraising in? What cut, should I make an adjustment for these sales? It becomes more complicated and it becomes a job that requires a lot of analysis by the appraiser. It's not that it can't be done. It just makes it a little more difficult. Right. And then they focus on, like, we were talking about the inspections only 20, 30 minutes, but the actual appraisal process of creating the report, that can be anywhere from three to 10 hours or more. Just trying to get all the, those data to determine what is the opinion of market value. Yeah, that's right. That, you know, the, the, you know, it's, it's a little like an iceberg, right? You know, you see the tip of it and you think you, think you know what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that would replicate the inspection process. But where the appraiser really earns their keep is the analysis of that sales information and, and being able to translate that to, to the house. So at, to your point, when they're writing up the appraisal report, they are doing a lot of work, a lot of analysis and being able to try to come up with those adjustments. And we have only a few minutes left. Um, last question though, but two different appraisers could have two different values and use two different comps. Yeah, as you said, you know, at the end of the day, appraiser, appraisals are an opinion. And, you know, so, so two perfectly competent and ethical appraisers could go in and have a different opinion as to a comp that they may use versus a comp that's not used what the adjustments might be, things like that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that an appraiser is bad, you know, or is trying to, you know, be too conservative with the value or anything like that. You, you could identify something like that if there's a pattern that that appraiser, that every appraisal comes in below what people think it's worth or what it's being sold for. But generally speaking, it is an opinion. The one thing I do want to make sure I mention for people is, is it sometimes gets confusing because when you apply for a loan, you typically pay the appraisal fee. That is part of the normal cost. Right. But the way that the banking laws work in this country is you're not the client of the appraiser. Correct. The bank is the client. So even though you pay the fee, it's really for the bank to, to decide whether or not the property is worth enough to make a loan on. You are entitled to a copy of it if you pay for it, but that doesn't mean you have a direct relationship with the appraiser. Right. Thank you very much for including that. You are correct. Unfortunately, you pay for it, but you don't own it. <laughs> correct. And that does get some people upset because they don't have that direct communications or be able to get the appraisal. They have to get it from their loan officer or the lender. Absolutely. So um, we have about 60 seconds left. Um, do you have like a couple words to say to people very quick? And yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, even if, the, even if you are the homeowner and you're not the, the client for the appraiser, it doesn't mean you can't ask your lender if you think the property wasn't valued properly or if there were mistakes in the appraisal. Laws absolutely allow you to do that. So if you find, if you get your copy and you have issues or questions or concerns, go back to your lender and say, I, would, I want clarification on this or I want them to take another look at this appraisal. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for coming on the show. And this topic was what to expect in a home appraisal. So if you have any questions, please email me. And thank you for watching Why and Why Not. Um, like us on Facebook and YouTube channel. And any other questions, please email us. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Janice. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.